All right, so here's, here's the deal. Probably for the next uh, three or four weeks, we are going to parse out number four, sharing the gospel. Because, because this has multiple layers that will be very important to talk uh, not only our philosophy of these things, but there's some very practical applications that I want our church to get. And so um, we are going to spend some time really drilling into this um, idea of sharing the gospel. What does it look like to be a church who shares the gospel? Um, at first glance, you might think that we're only talking about evangelism here, but this is really talking about um, the outward-facing nature of our church. This is really talking about how do we, how do we as a church, gathered and scattered, get the gospel into the lives of other people according to God's call for us to do so. That involves um, five things. Sharing the gospel entails... First of all, Christian apologetics. Christian apologetics, we we'll talk about. It involves personal evangelism. Okay, so individually, you uh, have a, a, a calling in life to be a witness to, uh, to the truth, to the gospel. This involves corporate evangelism, okay? which oftentimes can get lost in the shuffle. But there is something very important for the church to understand about what it looks like to be a gospel-sharing church corporately, okay? This also involves local and national mission, and along with that, things like church planting, and what is our vision and philosophy for that. And then fifth, global and international mission. So you can see there, there's some concentric circles, right? Um, and move, moving from a very personal level to the church corporately, to local, national mission here in our city, church planting here in this area, and then moving out uh, nationally, moving out, moving out to international mission, okay? So just wanna make that clear. There's, there's, that's why we're gonna spend some weeks on this. There's, there's several layers here, and I wanna make you know, in the, in the coming weeks, I want to get really practical about personal evangelism. What's my philosophy of, of the best way for you to think about personal evangelism of people in your life? Come on in, Jaber. You don't have to be so quiet over there, man. <laughs> I would appreciate you sitting in the front row, too. <laughs> Any questions about that so far, about the five layers of, of sharing the gospel? Okay. Um, I wrestled with what to start with. We're going to start with apologetics this week. And I wrestled with that. Um, I was going to start with personal evangelism and sort of move out, but I want to start with apologetics and talk about what that is at a grand, at a broad level, kind of 30,000 foot view, because there is perhaps nothing of greater importance um, that we need to reinstitute. So last week, what did we talk about? You remember? Discipleship, right? For some reason, Apologetics has been lost from the fold of discipleship. People don't think about apologetics being central to our discipleship. Uh, so coming out of discipleship last week, growing as followers of Christ, um, I want to talk about apologetics because in apologetics, we're going to talk a little bit about the world we live in and the necessity of defending the Christian faith. And in many ways, as we talk about apologetics, we will see why there's such an importance for us to learn things like personal evangelism. Why we want to do corporate evangelism well. Why we need to be serious about church planting. Because we live in a world that walks in the darkness. Apologetics deals with defending the Christian faith, showing the foolishness of, of the 
critiques and lies against it and showing forth the richness of the truth of God's story. And that's really what is underneath so much of our, our being an outward facing church. So we are a church that shares the gospel. We want everyone involved in sharing the gospel. And for starters, we need to be Christian apologists. Now I'll put it this way. You all are already Christian apologists. The question is, are you a poor Christian apologist uh, or do you do apologetics well? You are an apologist. Um, and we'll talk more about that here in a moment. So, I had the scripture printed out there for you, but uh, not, not the uh, outline notes. So you can write down what you like, you can sit back and listen and not worry about taking notes if that's your preference. We have this recorded so you can watch this again. Um, okay, you guys ready to dive in and talk about apologetics? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay, 1 Peter 3, 13 through 15. Now, who's there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Peter, writing to the churches. And here is, it is incumbent upon us to be a people prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is in us. We are a gospel-sharing church. Peter makes it clear that this is central to the mission of our church. 1 Corinthians 1, 18-25. I just want to get your wheels spinning with some of these scriptures that are so good and so challenging. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will, I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. That's really good. The church is the place on earth where you can see the heights of the beauty of the wisdom of God over and against all the foolishness of and you primarily see that in the preaching of God's word. And at the center of the preaching of God's word is Christ and him crucified. You guys know that we belong to a God who, who wants to show himself off, don't you, to the world he made? You know that we belong to a God who cares deeply about his reputation, who made us for his name's sake. We live in a world, correct me if I'm wrong, Abraham, we live in a world who does not enjoy showing off the glory of God and speaking rightly about Him. Do we? Who will show forth the light of His wisdom? Who has that news? Who has that message? It is the church. It is the church. And so we are the ones who get the privilege to show that the foolishness of God is wiser than Let's talk a little bit about apologetics at a, at a very broad level. I promise in the weeks to come, when we get into personal evangelistic conversations, I'm going to share some really practical perspective on, on doing apologetics, okay? 
and doing evangelism. But I want to sort of create the bigger picture of why we're even talking about this right now. Right? You guys know me. I like to start. I like to start with the big picture and then drill down. Um, and, and by the way, if you've ever been in one of my classes, stop me at any point. Questions, comments, things that make you angry, things that you disagree with. If you want to embarrass me, just go for it. Okay? <laughs> just stop the train anytime that we're rolling. I actually really enjoy that. Okay, what is apologetics? Apologetics is often a term that's confused with how we commonly use it in conversation. You know, like, I'm sorry. Uh, that is not the kind of apologetics we're talking about. Uh, we're studying apologetics in, in, in uh, the more technical sense, where it is derived from the Greek apologia. Um, this was a term that is used in the Bible. This was a term that was used in non-Christian literature. For example, the term is used in, in uh, Acts chapter 22 by Paul when he was faced with an angry mob. Uh, Paul uses that word there in speaking of his defense of the faith. Um, Socrates, right, in his defense um, uh, offered before the court of Athens, uh, spoke of, of uh, apologia. Justin Martyr, in his, in his uh, work entitled The Apology, uh, he sought to defend fellow Christians against false accusations that were being hurled at them. So, so as we talk about apologetics, we're talking about something that is not just some modern way of talking about the defense of the faith. This is, this is rooted in a very important part of church history, uh, the study which pertains directly to the development and use of a defense, okay? So we're really talking here ultimately about, uh, about a defense. And you know that all people and all religions do apologetics. All religions employ some form of apologetics. Uh, we're not going to be focused on all the various apologetics of all the different religions. We will be focused on what kind of apologetics? Ours? Christian. Christian apologetics. Very good. Uh, which is a defense of the truth as it has been revealed to us in the scriptures. Um, my professor in uh, my apologetics course in seminary, his name was John Frame, and his hero was a guy by the name of Cornelius Van Til. And I. I love Van Til's definition of, of apologetics. It's, it's, it goes like this. Apologetics is the vindication of the Christian philosophy of life against the various forms of non-Christian philosophy of life. Pretty simple, isn't it? It's the vindication of the Christian philosophy of life against the various forms of non-Christian philosophy of life. Um... John Frame would define it like this, the teacher I was speaking of. Very simple definitions here. The discipline that teaches Christians how to give a reason for their hope. Now, that is really important for us to do. Uh, not only to unbelieving people that you may work with, but if you have children, to your children, uh, even to fellow believers that need to be reminded why they have the hope that they have. Um, so the discipline that teaches Christians how to give a reason for their hope. Um, remember, Jesus made clear that the only foundation of our lives, right, every area of our life um, uh, that will withstand the storms is the foundation of his word. You can see it in the passage, Matthew chapter 7. Um, the only foundation in our lives that will withstand all the storms. And that, that includes sin around us. That includes lies. That includes persecution. The only foundation is his word. Look at Matthew 7 in light of, um, in light of this. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not, uh, does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, 
And the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So, um, our foundation for doing apologetics, of course, is God's word. As Jesus just said, if you don't have that, it's like uh, a house being built on sand. Listen to 2 Timothy. I think you guys have that verse there as well. Uh, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Uh, but as for you, verse 14, continue what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Um, you guys see, apart from what God has revealed to us in his word, we cannot do, we can do nothing but guess at the great questions about life, and about the cosmos, and about who is God, and is there God, and what is my purpose in life, right? Uh, we can only guess. People are groping for answers to those questions apart from what God has revealed. But we as Christians don't have to guess because God has made known what he wants us to know through his special revelation in the scriptures. Um, the, the, the word... Um, um, uh, corrects our interpretations of natural revelation, uh, which we've spoken deeply about in our membership class, if you've been there. Uh, there are times when it's good, right, and valuable to present arguments from natural revelation in non Christians, but we need to be careful that our arguments from natural revelation are in line with the teaching of the Bible. Um, so the scripture is our foundation. Uh, for this reason, countless attacks on the Christian faith are aimed at the Bible. Uh, the Bible is attacked because if we don't have that, we have nothing. Uh, the Bible is often accused of containing errors or having little or no more authority than any other writing because it's often necessary to defend belief in the Scriptures. Uh, it, because of this, it's necessary to defend belief in the Scriptures. Uh, the relation of apologetics to the Bible is sometimes misunderstood. Uh, because the Bible, get this, is both the foundation upon which our defense must be built and one of our beliefs which must be defended. So we do apologetics from the foundation of the truth of the Bible, right? We also have to defend the truth of the Bible. Um, again, this is a world desperately looking for some place to anchor themselves, to find truth. And as we just saw from Jesus, that foundation is Scripture. Uh, the, because the Bible reveals to us what is objectively true. Uh, I, I, I heard R.C. Sproul one time use this definition, or define truth in this way, and I think it's just a great definition of what truth is. He says, uh, truth is reality as it is perceived by God. Okay, Truth is reality as it is perceived by God. Well, if that's true, okay, if that's true, that reality... The truth is reality as it is perceived by God, um, then we have God's perception of reality in the Bible. And this is truth. Okay? Um, have you guys ever heard people say, well, um, oh, you say you're a Bible believing church or you're a Bible believing Christian, and all you do is argue from the Bible? And have you ever heard someone maybe critique that as a circular argument? You know, sir, have you heard that Scott on the college campus? Probably at some point. I'm not remembering a specific example, but probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah basically, you use the Bible uh, to say that the Bible is true, right? Yeah. And uh, that's a, a, a fairly common thing that is in church is often critiqued of. Um, that is, you know, Christians believe the Bible because the Bible says to believe it, and that's foolish. Um, but, you know, 
as we're talking here about the foundation for why we believe what we believe, and showing forth the wisdom of God, we have to know that everyone reasons this way. Everyone else in the world reasons in that circular kind of way. So every philosophy must use its own standards to prove its conclusions. Otherwise, it's inconsistent. So, for example, rationalists who believe the hu that human reason is the ultimate authority, they must presuppose the authority of reason in their arguments. Uh, empiricists must do the same for sense experience. Skeptics must be skeptical of their own skepticism. In other words, when any person argues for an ultimate authority, whether, whether it's scripture or the Quran, or human reason, or sensation, or anything else, he or she must use criteria that's compatible with their conclusion. If that's what people mean by circular, then everyone is, is guilty, right? Um, our ultimate standard is God's word in scripture. The, uh, the unbeliever's ultimate standard is located somewhere else. We're being honest about it. We're, we're being very honest to say our ultimate standard is scripture. Everyone has an ultimate standard, right? Um, it's just not, they're, all, they're, they're just not always honest about it. Or they oftentimes probably have no idea what their ultimate standard is. And part of our role, as we'll talk about in the weeks to come when we get really practical, we're going to talk about how to, how to connect dots for people. Part of our role is to connect dots for people uh, in our conversation because for the first time ever, you might help them to know what it is they really believe. Um, most people, even those who would attack the Christian faith, have no way of articulating what it is they really believe and why. And in our relationships, we may have the privilege to be used by God to connect those dots for them. To maybe even say, so, so let me get this straight. Here's, here's what I'm hearing. And for you to even say back to them, um, their belief system in a way they have never understood, um, right? So, so everyone um, uh, has some ultimate standard for determining truth or falsity. Um, so, our we're honest about ours. Most people don't know what their ultimate standard is, but it is located somewhere. So what we need to remember is, in this talk of, of defending the truth and apologetics, we must remember that the truth is objective, but people are not objective, okay? You got that, Matt? Truth is objective, but people are not. Which Matt are you talking to? Oh yeah, <laughs> that one back there. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't know I, I was wondering. A mat sitting in front of a mat. Yeah. Uh, truth is objective, but people are not. In this fallen world, when, a, when people attempt to reason, their reasoning is irrational because they have suppressed the truth. Again, what a joy to be the church and to boldly say, we're a place where there's truth. We live in a world that suppresses the truth rather than rejoices in it and agrees with it and embraces it. That's why we have so many of the, so much craziness around us because we live in a world who suppresses the truth. Does the Bible say something about that? Mm -hmm. And if so, where? What does the Bible talk about that? So that would be epistemology. Okay. In what you're articulating, right? Sure, yeah. How we know. Um, how, you, the, the, so how someone the, thinks. The, stu the study of knowledge and how you separate truth from opinion. Yep, and what is the best chapter in, in the Bible that talks about uh, that epistemology? That people do know something about God, but have suppressed that knowledge. Romans. Can you tell me that? One. Yep, Romans. One. One. Good job. And you're, you're a new member. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Yeah, you answered that question. That's what I did. <laughs> Romans 1. Um, go back and read that to Romans 1 shows what people do with God's natural revelation of what is true. They repress it, they disobey it, they exchange it for a lie, they devalue it, and they even celebrate those who hate and reject and rebel against the truth. So tell me this, we live in a world, again, I'm trying to make the case here for why we're talking about this, we live in a world 
that represses, disobeys, exchanges God's truth for a lie, devalues it, and celebrates those who hate it. Uh, so, is it important for us as God's ambassadors in this world to be people who know a thing or two about defending the truth? We live in a world that celebrates people who hate the truth. We live in a world who celebrates those who reject and rebel against the truth. So we need to talk about apologetics. We need to talk about um, uh, doing it well. Um, and that's, that's the reason why. Um, and it's important to know that even when we do apologetics well, when we defend the truth in the most logical and reasonable way, um, it often falls on hardened hearts and ears that are plugged because of the suppression of truth, because of ignorance, prejudice, or commitment to a certain ideology. Um, people are bent toward making decisions and accepting and rejecting things not based on the evidence or upon truth, but upon a complex brew of feelings, emotions, desires to be accepted by their friends or to find pleasure vague idea, upon vague ideas or certain impressions, fears, or assumptions. So everyone has this belief system in which they're suppressing truth. They have never connected all the dots as to why, but it's based on certain assumptions they have about life and about God. It's based upon... Um, their feelings, it's based upon um, uh, emotions and desires and pleasing their friends, all this. So we go out as a people to be a witness to the king. We go out as a people to be a light for Christ and for all that he said. And this is the context we're going out in. People who not only suppress the truth, who disobey it, who celebrate those who do, but they don't even know why, and there's not a clear reason as to why they've rejected it. There's a complex uh, mix and brew of those feelings and emotions, okay? So think about our cultural chaos right now. Um, at, at the root of our cultural chaos is, is an intellectual, theological chaos that, that essentially says uh, objective truth does not exist. Okay. Objective truth does not exist. Instead, and this ebbs and flows throughout the decades. Different decades sort of deal with different things, but some form of uh, uh, universal skepticism or subjectivism, which essentially says you can't know anything that's true. Um, you, 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 you can't know if anything's true. Or um, universally, uh, what is true is in the eye of the beholder, right? Or some form of religious skepticism where people basically say, we can't know anything about the religious world. That's unseen. There's nothing we can ever know about that. Uh, but what we can know is what we can measure scientifically, for example. Um, now, in recent years, it seems as though religious skepticism uh, has been... Uh, running the show um, and that's interesting because you 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 still hear people talk about um, the fact that we live in a world where where everything is subjective um, and you know no one thinks you can know anything about anything but have you noticed in recent years even think about the political world Think about what you see on social media. Think about what you see in the news. Do people believe things very dogmatically these days? Mm. Yes, they do. So don't tell me that people don't think you can know anything with certainty. They do. It's just not about the Christian faith, right? So there's this religious, even Christian skepticism. We live in this world where people say, of course you can't know if that's true. But here's what is true politically. 
Here's what is true uh, with various social issues. And if you're on the out, uh, and if you're on the outside of their belief system, we also know this is true. You're an idiot, and you're bad for the human race. So people are very sure of those things. Um, very dogmatic about everything else besides the things of God. Um, so, why does this matter? Why should we be motivated to talk about and to do apologetics well? Let me give you three reasons why I would like to see a new city be a church who really thinks apologetics. First of all, because God has commanded apologetics. God has commanded apologetics. Uh, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. So, uh, obedience to the king. We want to be people who does apologetics well because God has commanded it. Um, secondly, to defend the faith against the attacks of unbelievers. Um, we love the gospel. It is our treasure. It is our everything. I know you guys defend and protect that which is precious to you. There's nothing more precious than the gospel. So we're people who defend the truth. Uh, so in this sense, I'll get to number three here in a moment, but in this sense, um, defending the faith against the attacks on believers Apologetics is warfare. So when we talk about being a church who shares the gospel, we're talking about doing this in a culture where if we, if we take this seriously, there's no way it cannot be warfare. Whether we're talking about our church doing this corporately, uh, whether we're talking about you personally on the job site, you personally at your place of work, you personally in your family, and probably many of you have family members who are not believers and I know many people here at New City who try to talk about these things with their family, and it's warfare. Because there will always be enemies of the truth in this fallen world. So in apologetics, I want you to think about this, guys. Here's one of the great, here's one of the great callings we have as a church, okay? Don't forget this. We have the privilege to go out to be God's instrument to take back minds that have been stolen by lies. Mm -hmm. What a privilege we have. So whether we're talking about personal evangelism or world mission or church planting, why are we doing all that? Well, I'll tell you one reason. Because we get the privilege of taking back minds that have been stolen by lies. Either the lies of other religions, whether the lies of false kinds of Christianity, of, of, of false gospels, or whether the lies of all of the anti-Christian, anti-religious philosophies and, 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 and uh, ways of thinking around us. We get to take back minds that have been stolen by lies. Um, and, and with that in mind, here, here's something else that I want to characterize New City's approach to apologetics. Our warfare is against unbelief, not against unbelievers. Mm -hmm. okay. right. um, our warfare is against unbelief, not against unbelievers. Do, do you guys ever, um, you know, maybe... I don't want to paint a caricature here, but do you see that sometimes in Christian circles? Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever sensed that people view their warfare really as being against unbelievers, mm -hmm. not so much against unbelief, where really you can, you can end up hating people who, uh, at the very least, don't believe the way you do, but certainly those who attack your faith, we, we can grow to hate them. Anybody, anyone experienced that? Ever tasted that? Heck, I've probably done that all the time. I've probably, I have to repent of that all the time, right? Um, um, so that's why truth, both truth and love need to be part of our apologetic. Um, 
our warfare is not against unbelievers, but against unbelief. Okay. Um, look at uh, th this again is on on uh, number two. Our reason for doing apologetics is to defend the faith against the attacks on unbelievers. Look at Second Corinthians ten. Um, or do you guys have Second Corinthians sitting there? Yeah, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's why we can, that is, is that verse that can lead us to say we have the privilege to be instruments to take back minds that have been stolen by lies. We get to take captive, um, um, as he says here, every thought in obedience to Christ, uh, destroying strongholds, arguments, lies, right? Um, so, so when we talk about defending or arguing for the truth, this is, this is really important to talk about um, how we approach this as a church and individually. Uh, when we speak about defending or arguing, the arguing for the truth, we don't mean having a mean, angry, heated encounter. So when we talk about apologetics, I'm not talking about, Amanda, you, me you memorizing a hundred great one-liners. Um, <laughs> That, that you have something, you have one liner for everything they might say. And your goal is to make them look like a fool and embarrass them so they'll walk around, uh, away from you in shame. That's not what we're talking about, right? When we're talking about defending, defending the faith. Uh, we're also not talking about uh, boring back and forth about theoretical issues. Um, um, Right, we're we're talking here um, about developing the kinds of relationships where we get into people's worlds, we truly have concern for them and understand them and can help them to see why they believe what they believe. Uh, we can not only answer their questions, but get them questioning their own answers and coming to the place where they're open to hear the gospel, which will unveil the foolishness, the foolishness of what they believe and see the consequences of what they believe. You know, as a, as a gospel preaching church, as a church that seeks to defend the truth, again, think about the opportunity we have and that you have individually to help people to see the richness of and the excitement that the Christian faith might possibly be true. Because there's people that just, they, they don't give it any credence. There's no weight. But just think about through our conversations, our ministry, if people might come to the place where they say, could that really be true? If so, wow. And, and also to see if, if what I believe is true, they begin to see the consequences of that. They begin to see the holes in that. They begin to see the... the uh, uh, see, see, through our gospel ministry, that is what that, that is the, the destruction of their strongholds, right? That is taking thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. That's, that's the light coming into the darkness. That's why we're talking about apologetics. Because God has commanded it to defend the truth that we treasure. And, and thirdly, we also do apologetics to teach and to build up believers, we need, we need apologetics, right? We struggle in our faith. We have doubts and questions. And so good apologetics, um, a church where this is taking place, also teaches and builds up believers. Um, 
Let me, uh, oh, what time is it, by the way? 721. 721, okay, okay. Um, let me say this, and then we'll take just a few minutes for, for any questions or thoughts you guys have. Um, three, three parts to apologetics, okay? Real quickly. And this is what will get more practical than in the weeks to come. There's three aspects to being an apologetic church. And, and a Christian who does politics. Number one, apologetics involves proof. Okay, there is this, there, uh, proof, okay? Proving Christianity to be true and presenting a rational basis for our faith. Can you guys think of any examples in scripture where Jesus or an apostle uh, sought to to uh, present a rational basis for faith? Any examples you can think of? A rational basis for why we believe what we believe. Go ahead. I think uh, several times Paul in the book of Acts gives rational defenses for the faith. Okay. Depending on, and he kind of changes what he's Talking about depending on who the audience is that he's talking, he's sharing with. Okay, okay. Um, one thought I had in mind was Paul in First Corinthians fifteen, mm. who rationally sets forth the eyewitnesses of the resurrection mm. and some who are still living, and he goes through that wonderful explanation of Christ's bodily resurrection. If that didn't happen, we die in our sins. Mm. Here's here's the best rational explanation I have for why I know this is true, right? So you see Paul doing that. Paul is proving the Christian faith. We need, to, we need to do that. We need to be able to engage minds and show a rational basis for our faith. I think of John 20. Remember Thomas? I, I don't believe. I won't believe. Him. And Jesus like showing the nail marks in his hands, right? That, that is a rational, you know, he, there's, there's, um, there's a presentation of a rational basis for faith. There's several other examples. So number one, proof. Apologetics involves uh, us being able to present a rational basis for what we believe. Secondly, there's a defense, okay? We need to know how to defend. Uh, this is essentially answering the objections of unbelief, okay? Uh, answering objections of unbelief. Um, I mean, you can see Paul in his letters, he presents a defense in his letters to all kinds of challenges against, um, against the truth. Um, let me just, let's, I don't think I have, I don't think I have Philippians 1 listed there on your thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So listen, Paul uses this language here in Philippians 1, uh, verse 7. He says, it's, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense, there's that word, in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Uh, so he's saying to the church, you're partaking with me in grace and in the defense of the gospel. So, so that's part of our role as a church. That's part of our role is to be defenders of, of, of the truth of the gospel. Paul tells the church. Um, and then third, you know, I want to guess what the third, third is? We have proof, showing rational, a, a rational basis for, for what we believe, why we believe it. Defense, answering objections of unbelief. What do you think third is? Offense. Okay. Um, there, there is something biblically about attack. When I say attacking, again, we're not talking about mean, angry, make them run away in shame. Attacking the foolishness of unbelieving thought. Okay. Um, um, so God calls us not only to defend objections, but also to go on the offensive against falsehood. Um, 
non-Christian thinking is foolishness according to Scripture. And one role that apologetics plays is to expose this foolishness. Um, to expose this foolishness. I can read several scriptures um, but for the sake of time. I want them. Some of those are longer, but um, non-Christian thinking is foolishness according to Scripture. And one role we play is to expose this foolishness, um, which is a very loving and uh, it's a it's a loving way to serve people when you can expose the foolishness that is leading them into death, that is leading them into destruction. Um, and I'm going to talk with you about some practical ways to do this. Um, the ways that I think are best for us in this cultural context to engage in proof, defense, and offense of the faith. I'll tell you this. Um, our church will not be around long as a Christian church if we don't do apologetics well. Because we ourselves need to know why we believe what we believe. We need to defend it. And we need to expose the foolishness of, of all the lies uh, against it. And my hope is that this church will be a faithful and fruitful church for a long time. So I wanted to start with apologetics and our talk about sharing the gospel. Because um, there's a lot of churches who would say they're a gospel-sharing church, but they really don't have a gospel. In fact, I was reading. I was reading back through some of the uh, the, the church that was here previously. I was reading back through um, the things that they've said about themselves online uh, on their website under the about us section, and it was just it was really shocking to me. Um, claims of being a Christian church, a gospel sharing church, but inviting people to explore any avenue they would like into their spirituality and religious beliefs. Uh, saying we're, they even said we're a reformed church and what reform means is that there's no pope who determines what we think but we ourselves individually can explore all the uh, can, can, can explore all the boundaries of, 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 of faith right so what's happened there you have people using Christian language but long ago they stopped believing and had forgotten why they believe what they believe right so Long ago, they, there was, they had stopped defending the truth of the Christian faith and gospel. Long ago. Um, they stopped caring about exposing the foolishness of, uh, of the lies that undermined the gospel. And I'm just saying, we can't do that. Our, if we want to be a witnessing church, a gospel-sharing church, if we want to be a church who has real international mission and local mission and church planting, we have to love the truth, defend the truth, know why we believe the truth, and be able to engage with others in conversation about the truth and invite them into the truth. Um, so important. So, in closing, we can't avoid doing apologetics. You're, you are all doing apologetics now, um, but you, you can avoid doing it well. We can't avoid apologetics as a church, but we can avoid doing it well. So we, we must never forget or underestimate uh, the variety and richness of a biblical apologetic um, and our call to bear witness to him and to his truth. Um, I'll stop there. Would love to hear any thoughts, questions, comments, confusion. Uh, what do you guys think? No? All right. You guys were too talkative last week. Last night. We had fun last week. So. What's that? We had fun last week. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, yesterday was Fat Tuesday, right? Yeah. Anybody get their punch key? Exactly. No. All right, so next week we will um, start.
start talking about personal evangelism and some practical approaches to evangelism apologetics. And, and then we'll, we'll talk in the weeks to come about what it looks like in our church to be a church of world mission, why we talk about church planting, um, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, let me just pray for us, then we'll close out. Heavenly Father, we recognize that we um, are unworthy servants. We are unworthy recipients of your truth, or we're unworthy recipients to be uh, those who experience the blessings of the gospel because we are those who walked in darkness. We are those who would have stayed in darkness. We are those who loved the darkness. We're those who exchanged the truth for a lie. And you, in your mercy, sought us and found us and drew us to yourself, opened our eyes so that we would trust you, that we would love the truth more than a lie, and that we would see in Christ um, all wisdom, all truth, and our salvation. Lord, I just pray for each and every one of us that, that, that you would strengthen our faith in Christ, that you would strengthen us in the truth, that we, would, that we really would treasure um, what you have revealed, and that you would grow our hearts to be hearts of love that would really care that other people would know the truth, um, and that they would be freed from the trap of lies. Use our church toward that end, uh, do that in each of our lives, and I pray that we would be a, a people um, who passionately and faithfully would live our lives sharing the gospel with each other and with those whom we placed in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus.